Well, good morning. Good morning. Yeah, exactly. Don't let an agency see all the smiling faces and happiness. But who's the last one you're having? <laughs> no, Ron is no. No, you're you're good. You're good, Ron. I'm allowed to do it. For those who don't know, that's my lovely wife. <laughs> So, and actually, um, what she was saying is that uh, she was busy at home packing. That's why she was late, so we get in the house perfect. Anyways, uh, <laughs> after church, we're taking off and uh, we're heading out to Florida and I'm coming back on Tuesday. So, just a quick here and for me. And, um, yeah, so, anyways, just to say, I probably would be shaking hands after church and got to get going. So, uh, it's a little bit of a drive in Florida if you haven't been down there. So, uh, yeah, so anyway, just that's there. Um, you announcements right off the top. Does anybody recognize that woman? Uh, happy 90th birthday, and uh, she's not here today, but we had a fabulous, fabulous uh, birthday party for her yesterday. Lots of people, lots of conversation, lots of memories shared, and uh, so anyways, happy 90th birthday to Ruth Dewar. So that's, uh, that's quite a milestone. And uh, November 5th, we have our uh, Fowl's Supper, uh, but in conjunction with the Fowl's Supper, we actually have a silent auction, and the silent auction actually raises a fair bit of money for the church as well. And so, um, we're just saying, if you have something like to donate, um, you know, sometimes people do a high a month. Um, I think uh, Ron it used to do that. I don't know if you're doing that again, but I'm just saying that that was very. You can be bribed. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Anyways, that usually starts a bidding war when everybody wants one of these pies. But I just say that's just an example. Of, you know, we have everything grab will be donated to charity boards and pies. And what else? Like you, you said, there's some really neat stuff. What's that? Witches. Witches. Oh yes, we do have witches <laughs> donated. Um, anyways, some cute, cute uh, artwork is what we're saying. So. Anyways, that is that. Um, the tickets, I don't know, is, does anybody have tickets to sell yet? There's a few brought in, so we do have a few tickets, yeah. Uh, because uh, we were getting down, I think that was sold out, I was sold out. Uh, but some of a few more. Um, it hurt, good stuff, good to know. Um, anniversary service on November 3rd. And so on that Sunday, we have. Um, uh, Reverend Christine O'Brien, she runs Creek Hills, and she's going to come in, a uh, fabulous speaker, and I'm sure she'll have a great message for us. And uh, we're going to have the choir as usual, and roll, but we're going to actually have Tanya Lease as well, and then play some uh, piano music for us. And she always has beautiful music. So, uh, anyways, that is on the third. And actually that day, I'm actually going down to Seaport and Property Churches. I'm actually looking after their churches right now as their minister is on uh, medical leave. And so I'm just going to go down and just see if we kind of work out really well. This is something, and this is just, we're trying to see what's going to happen. Uh, we're going to Christmas in the country. Uh, we're going to have a concert that is going to be at uh, a bunch of and so we've got, I think, eight or nine different musicians. The choir's going to sing a role. I think we can cancel in. Um, Mary was going to sing. <laughs> no, no. I, I must have been misinformed. <laughs> Anyways, we got a whole bunch of different people lined up. And uh, actually, uh, Alicia Porschenbosch, the harpist from the summer services, she's going to play. And uh, so there's a lot of talent there. And it's just going to be some kind of fun. It's uh, going to be a little bit more informal and uh, just country style. Which one's the battery? It's that. So, yeah. Sorry, that's helpful. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, 7 o'clock. And I better get that off the very next time. Um, 7 o'clock, yeah. And uh, it's just going to be free will offering. And then we're just going to send that to the great banks. Um, for food banks, not food bank, food banks. Um, they're having quite a, uh, an uptake recently, and they're really struggling to provide food for everyone. 
so we'll support that through this concert. Uh, Remembrance Day. Uh, so we always have a Sintap service, and that's going to be November 10th, and it's Sunday at 2, 2 p.m., I believe, 2, 8, 2 p.m. Or is, is that right? 2 p.m. 2 p.m., okay. And uh, so anyways, um, we pray down um, at the memorial service. It's actually quite a nice service, um, like bears and the legion and uh, the emerging hands and all that. And then afterwards, uh, we're going to have some light like, refreshments at church here. Uh, some hot chocolate on the whole thing. So that's um, uh, November 10th. Yeah. I think that's everything I made. Is that Yeah. Has <laughs> 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 ever been late? They set back the clocks. I only did that once. You only go once. And then I can walk in the church at 11 now and walk to the main month of people remember and see so embarrassed. That's the last thing I'm about to do. Anyways, yeah, set back the clocks. Let's talk about it too. Well, our call of worship is a, uh, a responsive call of worship. Praise the Lord in every time and place. Boast only in the Lord. Spread the news of God's greatness. Church in this generation fills with courage and confidence 
to reach out to others with your mercy and grace. For you are our God, ever faithful to your people. Amen. So the uh, choir has uh, this <laughs> beautiful song today. Such good is going to happen to you.
And so they get out, they roll up, they roll up to the middle of the lake, and they're past the fishing rods and hooks into the water. And the one guy says, Oh, shoot, we forgot the fishing hooks. And the one farmer says, The other farmer, No problem, I'll run the shore and get them. So he jumps out of the boat, they're in the middle of the lake, and he runs to the shore, gets the fishing hooks out of the car, and he runs back in, they jump in the boat. And the other guy says, we forgot the bait. I'll go get it. He jumps out of the boat, run, runs across the water, gets the bait, runs back in, jumps in the boat. And of course, the minister's looking at this. This is odd. I only know one guy that can walk on water like that, and these two guys sure are not him. I uh, you know Jesus can walk on water. And so then uh, the other farmer, farmer says to the other farmer, you know what? I'm going to lock the car. You know, we should maybe lock the car. And he jumps out of the boat, runs across the water, locks the car, runs back into the boat. And then they say, you know, the car snacks. You know, the minister is looking at these guys and they're running across the water. So he thought, I can do that. And he says, no worries, I'll run across the water and get the snacks and I'll come back. And he jumps out of the boat and splash. He goes down. He fell in the water. And so the other farmer says to the other farmer, he says, do you think we should have told him what he stole to our walk on the water? He stole from the water. He was pure walking on the stones and he looked like he was walking on the water. So anyways, it's a story. A story. That was, what was that? That was a long joke. <laughs> Suddenly, the 
disciple saw some walking on the water towards them. There he was walking the stormy waters. And they thought it was a ghost. Jesus called out to them, It is I, do not be afraid. The disciples still weren't sure. So Peter said, If you really are Jesus, you have me walk out to you. And Jesus replied, Come on, come on now. Peter stepped out of the boat and began walking on the water. He walked towards Jesus. And then Peter looked at the wind and the waves and he became afraid as suddenly he started to sink. Lord, save me, he said. So Peter cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus reached him and pulled Peter up. Why didn't you trust me, Jesus asked Peter, as he climbed into the boat and the storm stopped. And the disciples worshipped Jesus. And they said, Truly, you are the Son of God. So Jesus has the power to call him who's not from the Lord. Just amazing. And so, any time that you come up here, maybe you're drowning, you know, just life is overwhelming, you can always reach out to Jesus and pray and ask him to help you. And he will. Dear Jesus, we are so thankful that you are there for us. That when we have trouble in life, we just have to ask, reach out to you, and you are there. For all these things we pray in your name. Amen. I understand you got a special treat at some stage. Pumpkins. So maybe after church, we'll see some pumpkin creations. Alright, you guys can have some fun.
is speaking. This is what the Lord says. Sing for joy for Jacob. Shout for the foremost of the nations. Make your praise as heard to say, Lord, save your people, a remnant of Israel. See, I will bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the ends of the earth. Among them will be the blind and the lame. Expected mothers and women in labor, a great throng will return. They will come with weeping. They will pray as I bring them back. I will lead them beside streams of water on a level path where they will not stumble. Because I am Israel's father, and Ephraim is my firstborn son. Amen. And then we turn to Psalm 126. And uh, this is a, a response of reading. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. My house is filled with Our house is songs of joy. And then it said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, and our streams in the name. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. For those who love weeping, bearing the seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, bearing the seed to sow. Amen. Mm -hmm. And then our gospel reading this morning, this is the one we're focusing on. Um, so we have Artemis, he's a blind man. And uh, it's kind of interesting in uh, Mark, uh, he doesn't um, name people in there. For some reason, he names Artemis. And uh, there's also something kind of odd in here when you're reading it. Um, when, you, when you listen to it, it it's, um, let's see if I can find it here. Um, anyways, it's talking about Jesus was going to Jer uh, Jericho and he was leaving Jericho. And it just doesn't seem to make much sense. And, um, Well, it doesn't really make much sense to um, But anyways, one of the things about it is um, when you read that, that little piece of scripture, there's a little, you know, Jesus was going in, then he was going out, and he was going in, and it really doesn't make much sense. But if you know um, some of the history, uh, there was actually two Jerichos. You had the original Jericho, and then King Herod built a mile outside of the town another Jericho for all the administration, and for all the you know, the, the governors and, and all the ruling people were. And so there was kind of a stretch between the two, uh, people would be going back and forth between them. And it would be a very logical place for a beggar to be because that's where all the people were going back and forth. And so that's uh, kind of when you read this, and it doesn't really seem to make sense, but if you understand the cultural context and, and the circumstance at the time, it does make sense. Uh, so anyways, let's um, read the story of Artemis. When they came to Jericho, as Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city, a blind man of Artemis, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he rebuked him and told him, Be quiet. But he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want him to do for you? Jesus asked him. And the blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see you. Go, said Jesus, your faith is healed. Immediately received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Amen. <laughs>
an interesting conversation with a fellow this, uh, this past week. So um, we actually have a few people in the hospital, and uh, so I was at the hospital news visiting. I'm kind of cheap, so I parked there with that whole church, so I don't have to pay the $2 at the you know, hospital parking lot. And I walk down, I need the exercise, you know, just, uh, just what I do. And uh, the whole church says, yeah, you can park there. Uh, the earlier part of it is that if you ever park there, you can see a prayer for the church. So, it works for me. So, anyways, uh, as I was getting in the car and walking down the hospital, I could see there was a fellow uh, just in front of the Bethel church. And I uh, had a how to thing just laying at his feet. And I thought, oh, there's a guy waiting for a ride. And uh, I didn't think much of it. So, I went into the hospital, did some visiting, and came back, and uh, I was walking down the sidewalk. And See him, he was still up there for the church. And he was kind of looking around, and then he spotted me. And I think he was looking at the clergy shirt. And uh, he started, you know, like, hey, pastor! And he comes towards me, and I'm thinking, you know this guy? And uh, it turns out, no, because sometimes my memory is not so good, or names will come. I did not know this fellow. <laughs> he starts just chatting on the stone. What church do you belong to? What church? You know, said Alabama Presbyterian. Oh, I know Alabama Presbyterian. That's down in Alabama. Yeah, it's in Alabama. But it was very interesting. He started going on about the ministers. He says, "Oh, you know Don Clark? Oh, yeah. Did you know when Doug uh, Andrew Thompson was here before?" I go, yeah. And he says, yeah, there was another guy that I really liked from there. Um, what was his name? Alan Barr. That's going back a lot of years. And uh, he's, he's like, this guy do ministers. So I thought that was very interesting. So I yeah, there was kind of Presbyterian uh, background. And so, you know, we continued talking. He was uh, kind of shared with me. He says, you know, I don't really like to share this with too many people, but I'm homeless. And I thought, oh. And then he started saying, I spent the night at the little towel at the Gap Park Endless School there. It's, it's rather expensive. I'm getting down the strap for That's where I want to go. And I kind of get out of maybe it's family down there. But you know, it's just traveling down. And, and, uh, and then we get to the beat of the problem. And then he says, Can you give me a ride and how? And you know, it was kind of spinning rain, and I'm looking around, and he's been standing there for about an hour, not much luck. And uh, I'm just kind of in my head, and this is how, you know how the scripture really speaks to you? Because this was the scripture lesson when I was preaching on this week, and I was in my head. And I'm thinking to myself, I thought there's stuff I want to do. I wasn't going to go to Apple, I was going to have plans. And, uh, you know, I. But anyways, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, and you see where the disciples you look at this as part of this guy, a similar life. You know, yeah, we just had this big, uh, maybe they were preaching in Jericho, they were heading out, you know, they were tired, they just wanted to get on to the next stop, maybe get a meal, and here they have this nuisance, father and martyr of sinner. And I, I don't want to use the word nuisance, like the fellow of great love. Saying these are my own inward feelings that you know what I got better than I do. And uh, so, anyways, he started to share that he was up in the north end trying to get a ride, and everybody just drove past, but he was there for a few hours, and somehow we got down to the church. And I understood why he was about the church, because the parking lot was full, and he was probably asking everybody that was coming out for a ride. Just a very, very interesting conversation. Very 
French vessel full sidebar, he said. He said, I heard that there is a homeless encampment over a year and a half. So what else? Yes, it's there. If you look carefully, you can see it. And he said, I wish those people wouldn't do that. And I'm kind of listening to this, and I initially thought he wanted to go there, you know, and find some other people to share shelter, but, um, but no, he was very judgmental about homeless. And I'm thinking, well, if you're homeless, you're judgmental about homeless people. It was kind of a weird juxtaposition. But he said, they give us homeless people a bad rap. I have trouble getting rides over there because they have one of those homes. Very, very interesting conversation. You know how we have these prejudices in amongst ourselves, amongst our own people. You know, as I reflected on this, I really believe that this fellow just wants someone to listen to the story. Sure was not afraid to ask questions. I just wants to pay attention to them. But if we look a little closer at the big picture of the story of Artemis, you know, it gives a little context to the story. So, in the bigger picture, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. Jesus is on his way to the cross. He knows this. He's been telling his disciples. I'm going to the cross, I'm going to be crucified, rise in three days, and they just do not get it. And so this story of Artemis is the very last healing story before Jesus' journey to Jerusalem. The last story before he goes to the cross. And so there's actually two healing stories. And I found this rather remarkable when the choir sang that song this morning about the blind man. That was the first healing story. Blind man outside the gate. And this is the second healing story. And so when the, the gospel writers are putting together their gospel story, there's a reason why they put things together. And so this means that this is very, very important in the story of this little chunk of the, of the Bible. And so Jesus is, or Mark is in a lot of ways saying, pay attention here, there's something important about this physical sight. Blindness. I think what Mark is really addressing is the spiritual blindness that's going on. You have two kinds of blindness. You have this physical sight you can't see. But you have those disciples over there, they can't see either. They're spiritually blind to what's going on. So Jesus can continually prepare his disciples for death and resurrection, but they are just not getting it. They're busy thinking about what they will do after their dreams of triumph and success will come true. Even after all those speaking miracles, healings, the teaching of Jesus, they miss the point of Jesus in the making. They're still blind. Before this story, I read it last week, the week before, I can't remember. I think it was two weeks ago, when they were arguing who was the most important son. Who was going to send Jesus <laughs> Jesus tells him, whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be the first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life for the rights of the world. And the point is, it's not about going and getting more power or status, but about letting go and getting down and pot up and pot up. Have faith that Jesus is the one in control, not the world of powers. You know, we have a problem to use the world because so many people are not connected to God. They don't understand what God is because they don't have the foundation. They don't have the language. We Christians are very lucky because as you raise the faith of your other people talk about God, they give voice to our understanding of Jesus in this how we can speak to him. And a real life example of this is past week, um, Christine O'Brien, uh, who's going to come here on, on November 3rd, uh, I was talking to her, uh, doing a bit of work with the free bills for the church. And um, anyway, she uh, was talking with one of her employees. 
fabulous, remarkable uh, person, really high caliber person, really he's probably too good for three meals. And he came there because I think he was looking for something. Or in fact, I think he was looking for something. So anyways, he, he was talking to Christie and says, I really need to talk to you about him private about something. And so Christie says, sure. And actually, the one heard this story at some of the presbytery, she's been sharing this story with a lot of people. Uh, they had a child. And the fellow said, I really believe that God has called me to truth. Now, this is a fellow who's not a man of faith, doesn't know how to express his feelings and his desire for God. But he went on to say that. You know, self-reflection, he was a little bit arrogant, a little bit prideful, a little bit boastful, he was not a lot of people serving the years. Taught a lot about pride. Pride is one of the biggest sins in the Bible. When I just thought of toning that down. The Christian said, he just didn't have the words to explain what this was right. And then she wanted to say that they actually have a few people in crew that have no faith, but they don't have this word that when something remarkable comes along, it's a beauty of God's world, they just don't know where to go, how to describe it, how to interpret it. But we as Christians have it because we have this foundation that we've been built on. A lot of us write the word, some of us are a little bit later in life, but we have a foundation. The foundations aren't always perfect. I have this whole practice. And so when uh, the bride to be Leslie showed her this beautiful house, it was an old farmhouse, an old bachelor lived in it before that, there was no kitchen in the bathroom, no nothing. And I didn't see a diamond in the world, it was really beautiful. The bride, on the other hand, was taking a look at this. <laughs> but we renovated, we fixed it up, that's what you do when you have no money. And, uh, but this house was interesting, is that how many of you lived in old farmhouses? Yeah, it was a, yeah, a, whole, a whole lot. This house, you could put a bar hole in one corner and it would fly across the floor in the other corner. <laughs> And we hung the pictures on the wall, we would put the level on it to make sure they were level, right? When we stood back and looked at it because the floor was going this way, everything was going to be And uh, we had friends that were joking about our unlevel pictures in the house. Can't you guys get your pictures in level? Well, it's a perspective that they were level, but the rest of the house was. I'm just saying, sometimes the foundations aren't perfect because they weren't built for me in the first place. But those foundations may they determine how we find meaning in the world. It makes us the intrinsic our meaning when we look at the world trying to interpret what the world is about. Faith has a large part to do with it, it's a large part of that foundation. And if you don't have that foundation, you're kind of in big trouble. You know, we all have our own way of making sense in the world. You know, if you go outside, you see a bird flying, you look at it, it's a bird flying. But that makes sense in the world. But let's say you, you walk out here and, and you see a cat flying across the air. That doesn't compute, does it? And so you've got to figure this out. So, you know, you. You either reject it, say, that can't be possible, I must have seen things. Should have had more sleep last week, or maybe for some of us who had an extra drink last week, whatever it is. You just reject it. Or you maybe make a sensible explanation for it. So, you get a built a cat in the backyard and decide to let the cat fly. <laughs> 
try to explain it away. Or, we have to reconstruct our foundations as we gain new insight into the world and try to allow us the world to be by the past. But you know, too, with all this situation, the brain is trying to make sense of something that appears to be nonsense. Because it, it has to try and make sense of it, because we can no longer make sense of our experience. And because of that, we can no longer function that world. Artemis in her story is like that. He's a man who's trying to sense this world, trying to find meaning in his purpose in this world. And he has found that meaning. You know, we always talk about Barnabas as a healing story. I think we have to look at it as a calling story to God. God is broken through Barnabas. Jesus is broken through to him. He shattered those old foundations that he's built his life on, of them um, relying on someone else. To become the first in the way the world and others. And they include unlocking this story is the cloak. Did anybody look at that story and think? Isn't that weird? Why does this book off the runs of Jesus? If you look in the, the Bible story, uh, Jesus actually teaches that if you, somebody owes you money, you cannot take the cloak off. You can take his blood over and day if you have to go back. The cloak's are very, very important to people because it's a only means of saving more. If you're a homeless person, that cloak is a difference between life and death. You need that cloak to stay warm. You need that cloak to sustain life. And yet Barnabas is flinging off this cloak. He's giving it away. He needs to be crying. But you notice he does this even before Jesus heals him. He recognizes that that cloak is holding him back from life. He recognizes that his oil faithful him. This cloak needs to be gotten rid of. So he can change his ways, change his foundations, serve Jesus. And that feeling is so strong, it overflows, overpowers. And he wants to be well. He discovers that Jesus can give him more than he can ever, ever want.
Let's lift our voices and up. Sing out loud, number 372, praise him, praise him.
we now are as before God with our prayers of Thanksgiving and intercession. We continue to think about our firefighters. They were just out again yesterday and uh, they're really busy. So just to remind you, remember them in the prayers as well as all the families whose uh, families dealing with uh, loved ones in the hospital, some of the lost loved ones. And so remember them. Just and merciful God, we turn to you in hope and in gratitude. When the world around us seems troubling, we are grateful for your steadfast love, that foundation that we have been built upon. Thank you for your spirit of work in all times and places, calling out the best of your people, showing us when we must repent, opening paths for reconciliation when we have been offended with the proclamation of your prophets and the compassion of Jesus in mind, we will seek your justice and know your mercy day by day. We pray for justice among the nations, great more generous sharing of resources between countries with good harvest and those who live by famine, where resources are extracted for export or temporary advocates for fair wages and environmental protection, where there is aggression and intimidation between nations, war, and raise up the willingness to make peace and settle differences fairly. We pray for justice in the workplace. May those who work for others be treated with dignity and earn a fair wage. May all who create that work earn a fair return. Create equity and a respect for those of different backgrounds and identities and guide young people with opportunities to develop their gifts. Well, every one of us needs some kind of healing in our lives. Remember before you those struggling with illness of body, mind, or spirit, those waiting for diagnosis or treatment, those who are experiencing grief, and all those whose health challenges are visible to others. We raise them for you. And dear Lord, we especially want to remember the first responders in our communities. Firefighters that encounter things that are just indescribable and affects them permanently. Dear Lord, we ask your healing touch on them, bringing peace to that situation. We remember the firefighters, the policemen, the paramedics, all those first responders that help them to sink in the world that continues to time. Dear Lord, we raise them. Dear Lord, your spirit prays within us, even when we cannot find the right words. So hear us this day and answer in ways that encourage your faith and change the world for good for the sake of Jesus Christ, who taught us this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in the as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. As we forgive those who sin against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the Lord is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So we're going to sing number 755. This is, we've sang it before, but it's, it's a different one. It's got a, a little bit of a beat. Um, so let's try something. By go me into the world.
his face shine upon you and in peace from this day forward and forevermore. Amen. Mm -hmm.